Hi, I'm going to show you how to make a digital negative today. Digital negatives are printed on an inkjet printer and are used in alternative photographic processes. If you're shooting digitally, of course, you need to get it into an analog realm in order to use the process. But if you're shooting film, why do you need a separate digital negative? There are three good reasons. First, you can make a print larger than your negative up to the maximum size your printer can handle. Second, you can use the power of Photoshop to dodge, burn, dust spot, and optimize your image. Third, and most importantly, the curves for these alternative processes are very non-linear. Let me give you an example. Here's a sample curve for a calotype. As you can see, it rises sharply in the shadow region. This means that it takes a big change in the negative to make a noticeable change in the shadows. It flattens out in the mid-tones and highlights. It only takes a small change in that area to affect the mids and highs. It would be very hard to get this result with wet film development. Here's the original image and what it looks like with the curve applied and what the negative looks like. Okay, let's get going. I assume you have the materials to make an alternative print like a calotype, cyanotype, or Van Dyke brown print. Refer to my other videos if you need help getting started. I also assume you have some version of Photoshop. You'll need a photo quality printer. The ones marketed as office printers will leave lines or dots that will ruin your negatives. Most of the people I know working in these media are using Epson Stylus Photo and Epson SureColor printers. They use Epson's pigment-based ultrachrome inks. I've heard of printers using Canon Pixma printers, but their dye-based inks can make it difficult to get enough density in the negative. Whatever printer you use, you should use gloss, not matte ink. Epson calls their gloss ink photo black. Matte ink will smear horribly. You print your negatives on overhead projection film. Pictorical Pro is the gold standard here. Its heavyweight stock doesn't curl and holds ink well. It's fairly expensive, but I recommend you use it until you have some experience. Coat a piece of paper the normal size you expect to print. You will cut this up and make several prints from it. Store the unused portion in an envelope away from light and air and plan to use it within a few days. Leave one border uncoated, perhaps three quarters of an inch or two centimeters. You'll see why in a moment. I mask the paper with scotch magic tape to leave a crisp uncoated border. Cut off the border along with a couple of inches or five centimeters of coated paper. You will use this to find the shortest exposure that will give you a true black. Even unprinted transparency film has a certain density. You have to find an exposure that will give a true black through it. Mark the white border in pencil with minutes or half minutes. You have to estimate the printing time. For calotypes, a sunlight exposure is about four minutes, a commercial exposure unit about five or six. I know from previous testing that my hanging light will need between 10 and 20 minutes. Here I'm going to give it from 6 to 23 minutes. Your own printing time will be different. Cover half the coated portion with unprinted film. Hold it down with your regular cover glass, which also has a certain density, and start to expose. After 6 minutes, I cover the first step and continue exposing. After each minute, I cover another step until I have every step from 6 to 23 minutes. You may find it easier to start with the strip mostly covered and progressively uncover it. Process your test strip exactly as you will a final print, including toning and fixing, but only give a few seconds of wash at the end. When it's dry, examine it closely under good light. Remember that I said it takes a big exposure difference in the shadows to make a noticeable difference? The tonal differences will be subtle, which is why I'm showing you a diagram and not the actual print. This is what the actual test strip looks like. Pick the first exposure where you can't tell a difference in tone between the covered and uncovered parts. That's your exposure time. The next step will automate the process of producing a curve. Kevin Bjorke deserves sainthood, or at least a medal, for his free Photoshop script called Chartthrob. You can search for it by name or click the link you see here. Download the script and put it in your scripts folder, which you'll find here. Then quit and restart Photoshop. Navigate to your scripts folder and find Photoshop or use the browse function to find it. When you first launch the script, it looks like this. Click Build New Chart Now. Chartthrob thinks for a minute and produces a density chart for you to print and use. There's a whole procedure for printing on film. I use Bostick and Sullivan's method.
Rather than going through it here, I'll link to their tutorial. Importantly, their printing method adds yellow ink to the shadow areas. Yellow is a light color to our eyes, but it is quite opaque to ultraviolet light. This adds extra density to the areas that will be highlights. Starting with the chart throb chart, invert it to a negative, and then flip it horizontally. You print on the top surface and then flip it over for printing. Flipping the image keeps everything right side up. Print it and there's your negative. Cut another piece of your coated paper to match the test chart and make a print. Scan it as an RGB image on a flatbed scanner and keep the white and black points just outside the histogram curve. Keep the midpoint of the scanned curve neutral as you see here. Here's the scanned chart. Desaturate it with Image, Adjust, Desaturate, but keep it as RGB. Use levels to move the black and white points to the ends of the histogram. Crop it to just the chart. Now run Chart Throb again. This time click Analyze. Once again, Chart Throb thinks for a bit and gives you this message. Open the Layers palette and you'll find it has made a curve for you. Save that curve or it will disappear once you close the scanned image. I'm calling it CT for Chart Throb 1. The curve is pretty irregular. The scan picks up the texture of the paper and slight irregularities in the coating. Do the best you can to even the curve out, then simplify it by deleting about half the points. Then save the simplified curve. I'm testing a Citrate developer today, so I'm calling the new curve Citrate 1A. At this point, I find it's easiest to leave test charts behind and print an actual image. Choose one with a good range of tones from light to dark. Crop in to an area that has near whites and almost blacks. Size it so you don't use up too much of your sensitized paper. In the Layers palette, click here to make a Curves Adjustment layer. Find your simplified curve and apply it. Flatten the image and then invert it. Flip it horizontally and then print it. Make a print and when it's dry, examine it. Unless you're extremely lucky, the print will not be perfect. In my case, it's really bad. There's a good black, but the other tones are all way too light. I'm looking at a scan of the test print I just made. I also have open my original cropped in test image. To see both images at once, I go to Window, Arrange, Two Up Vertical. To better compare the two images, I desaturate the scan. To even out the texture of the scan a bit, I make sure the sample size of my eyedropper tool is set for 5x5 five five pixels. I'm going to read areas in the scan that are almost black and almost white and change the curve to make my sample image match it. Back in my original test image, I choose Curves Citrate 1A. I'm going to read the values on the right and change the curve on the left to match. I open the Info palette. I use the eyedropper tool to read the scan and find the darkest part of it that still holds detail. It's around 52. The lightest texture in the onion reads 203. Now I go back and forth between the curve and the info palette, darkening the sample image until the highlight and shadow are where I want them. One oh three and two twenty six, way too light. Fifty eight and two oh three, close enough. I go over to the layers palette and save curves preset. I'm calling this curve Citrate one B. Incidentally, if you want to shortcut this process of refining your curve, you can make and save a number of slightly different curves, then print them all at once on one sheet. Here's the print with the curve I just made, Citrate 1B. The highlights are better, but the contrast is too low.
The shadows are still too light and the highlights look dull. I need to steepen the curve. Dragging the shadow side down will add contrast to the mids and highs and make the whole image better. I make that change and call the new curve Citrate 1C. I print a new negative with curve 1C and tape the last two pieces of sensitized paper together to make a print. I'm really happy with this one. I'm going to brighten the highlights and midtones a tiny bit and make curve Citrate 1D. I'm confident enough in my new curve to make a full size print. Here's the finished print. I'm very happy with it. Let's take a look at it closely. The print has a good range of tones and just a hint of detail in the brightest whites. The blacks will never be as dark as a silver print or inkjet, but they're as black as the calotype process allows. Once you have a working curve, it's easiest to adjust the image before applying the curve to it. I find that 247 is the brightest textured white and 37 the darkest textured gray. I make sure the original image's tones fall within those limits and true black falls comfortably below 37, perhaps in the 20s or teens. My prints turn out great. Making a curve is a complex process, but once you've got it, you can be confident that your prints will turn out the way you want. If you have questions, leave them in the comments. Thank you.